everybody. Um, I'd like to share just some thoughts on the passage of uh, the woman with the issue of blood, that in Mark, um, where Jesus, I'm sure you know, who are familiar with this passage, but I just want to share something that, I, that the Lord put it in my heart. So uh, the situation was, Jesus was coming, was passing by, when um, the ruler, one of the rulers of the synagogue approached him because his daughter was sick. And um, he wanted the Lord to go and, and pray for her. So meanwhile, as Jesus was on his way, and this is in the chapter 5 of Mark, um, there is, you know, a lot of people around him, a multitude around him. And, uh, and then that's when this woman shows up. So I'm going to read the passage and then just share um, some thoughts. So um, it says like this. So Jesus went with him. He's talking about the, the ruler. And a great multitude followed him and thronged with him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. Pay attention to this detail. 12 years. And had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew wor worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garments. So she heard about him, she came behind him through the crown and touched his garments. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately. I love this about <laughs> the book of Mark, so many immediately. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Hallelujah. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crown and said, Who touched my clothes? I'm going to stop here, talk a little bit, and then we're going to continue. So, first of all, it's very clear here that this woman was dealing with a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. And I believe not only physical, but emotional as well, because back then, you know, there was a little um, thought in the culture, in the Jewish culture, about when a woman would be in her period, that would be like, you couldn't touch her. So this woman was, you know, bleeding for 12 years. So it was a very, you know, hard situation for her, um, physically and emotionally as well, I believe. So she hears about Jesus, and she's persistent. She goes after him with all she had. The word says that she came behind him through the crowd and touched his garment. So this is a great metaphor for us, you know? Like, I don't know what you're facing in your life, or maybe you have faced, or maybe you were still facing some hardship, some difficulties. And, uh, and what you need is to go after the Lord, really, with fervency, with everything you have, and touch his garments. The word says that as she reached out to him, she went through the crowd. Imagine that should not be easy because so many people pushing her back or maybe saying, no, you know, you're not going to get close to the, to him or whatever. But she persisted. She went through. So she went through and she touched his garment because in her heart she said, look at her faith. She said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. So she established something. This is a woman of faith. This is a testimony for us. Like, you know, how the Lord responds to faith. I usually like to say that um, faith and hunger, he responds so much. Like faith, we know faith is the currents of heaven. Everything in, in, in the kingdom of heaven is, is done, is conquered by faith. It's our, it's the language we speak in heaven, it's faith. And, uh, and here we see that she has that, but not only that, she's hungry for him. So she's very, you know, persistent in her heart. And she decides that if she only can touch his garment, she would be made well. She didn't even need him to pray for her, to lay hands on her. All she needed was to touch his garment. So, you know, sure enough, she goes after it. Jesus doesn't even know. And you see how hunger, I, I love hungry people because when we 
minister to those that are hungry today. You know, they, 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 they just, I, I usually say the hunger, like when you're ministering or you're preaching the gospel or you're talking about Jesus or whatever it is to somebody that is hungry, somebody that is desperate for him. What happens is that their hunger, their desperation pulls the anointing out of you. And, and you're just, you know, and that's when you see, like, even miracles. So here's a hungry lady. She touched Jesus, and the word says that immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she was healed in her body of her affliction. And then verse 30 says that Jesus immediately knowing in himself the power had gone out of him. You see, the hunger from her, her faith and her hunger pulled out virtue from, from Jesus, and her miracle happened. But I thought it was so interesting that Jesus knew that somebody had been healed already. Why did he still pursue her? Why did he still ask? Like he, he, he We're going to keep reading here, and he says that he asked the disciples, what happened to me? Who touched me? Look at this, it says, um, Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crown and said, who touched my clothes? The disciples said to him, the disciples are just funny here, man. You see the most of the throng in you, and you say, who touched me? Like the disciples were like, how are you asking? What does it really matter, right? I mean, they were clueless. <laughs> Sometimes the disciples are just something else. But anyways, it gives us hope, right? Because we're all full of flaws. So if they turn the world upside down, so can us in Jesus. Anyways, so it says that he asked that. And then he looked around to see her who had done this. It amazes me, the fact that Jesus already knew that she was healed. And still, he was after her heart. He wanted to give her something else. Not only, not only the physical healing. As you can see here, he continued to, to read. Uh, he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing that had hap what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. She was so humble. She was afraid. She didn't know Jesus. She didn't know what would be his attitude. She just wanted to be healed. So I, I believe she was afraid because it says here, fearing and trembling. So she was out of a, um, a position of a, um, a fear and respect at the same time. But she was very humble. So she fell down before him. Imagine the scene. She fell down before him, and she told him the entire truth. She was so great. I learned so much out of this character in the Bible because she faced her fear. She was very brave. She was humble and brave to tell him everything. And as she spoke what had happened to her, this is my favorite part, he, verse 34, he said to her, daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. So I believe Jesus was after this lady. Um, he knew that she, she had already been touched physically. Um, he knew she received what she was looking for. But his dreams and his thoughts for her were far beyond that. He wanted her to know that she was a daughter of God. He wanted to brand in her the identity of a daughter of God of somebody that has a father, and it's the daughter of the king, the daughter of the Almighty One. So he spoke over her, her identity. He called her daughter. He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. So he called her daughter. He spoke her identity over her. He assured her faith. He valued that and assured. In other words, he said, you keep on doing what you're doing. You keep on believing, you keep on pressing, you keep on pursuing, and you will do very well because your faith in me, your faith has made you well. That's the way for victory, to believe, to have faith. And not only that, then he speaks over her peace. In other words, she has an encounter. He opened up himself to her. He revealed himself to her. He pursued her after he felt that she touched it. Somebody touched him. Then he pursued this person. You see how our hunger to him. We come to him and we are hungry. And then that, he pursues our hearts. So he pursued her. And he made 
made a decree upon her life. He told her to go. He sent her out. He sent her out in peace. Go in peace and be healed of your afflictions. Any other, any other affliction that she might be fighting, we don't know, maybe depression, maybe anxiety, maybe fear, maybe doubting, any other affliction in her soul, maybe another disease in her body that we don't know of. So he said, go. He told her, go in peace. Amazing, right? It really amazes me. It amazes me. So he spoke her identity. Anyways, this is interesting. Now, let's just follow. It's a little long of text, but just let's let's continue because there is more into this. Hold on. Um, the text continues, verse 35, and it says, While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Okay. I want you to visualize now this scene. Jesus was walking. He was walking. He was walking with some disciples, with the multitude. And remember the ruler that first approached him. They were on the way for the miracle for the ruler, daughter that was already dead. In this moment, it's like this woman is like an interruption. The ruler could have seen it as an interruption. To like imagine somebody you love is about to die. You want the person who's going to pray to hurry up. Suddenly, this woman takes all the attention, it stops, and Jesus ministers to her. And right after, these people come and say, Your daughter is already dead. Why you bother the teacher any longer? And this moment was a defining moment for the miracle, for the ruler's daughter. Had him doubt right here, he would have lost me. Because, you see... What looked like what seemed an interruption in the natural eyes was actually an atmosphere of faith being created, being prepared, so that the other miracle would be revealed. So imagine with all these, like the healing and what God said to this woman and all that, probably this ruler was next to him and his face was being built up. He was probably thinking, wow, I'm the next one. I'm right here in line, the next one. I'm ready for my miracle. He's done that for this woman that's been sick for 12 years. He's going to do it for my daughter. I just saw with my own eyes the power, the future that comes out of this man. And my miracle is coming today. So his faith was being built up. It was an atmosphere of miracle, an atmosphere of faith that was being created at that moment, preparing for the next step, which would be the resurrection of, of the daughter, of the ruler. Right? And right in this moment, pay attention. They come and they say, Why bother the teacher? Your your daughter is already dead. You see, this to me speaks so much of the voice of the enemy. And sometimes it can be just the whispers, um, you know, or even through people or situations saying, Why are you gonna keep on? <laughs> just quit. It's done already. Your situation has, you know, has no hope. Many people dealing with diseases, sicknesses or situations in life they are about to get a breakthrough everything is being prepared and then still the enemy try to come and take the focus away and make them look at the failure or you know at the circumstances or at the disease or whatever you're facing in life so i just want to encourage you it's crucial very crucial that we maintain our eyes and locked into jesus gazing at him looking at him and our heart focusing faith on that which he is doing on that which jesus is saying and not the people and not the enemy and not the circumstance and not the tv news and not the economy of the world or whatever else you're dealing with look at that as soon as they say that um then it says uh, as soon verse 36 as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken he said to the ruler of the synagogue do not be afraid only believe you see it's so interesting here because if you would go by the logic um, it would make sense they could just come and they say she's dead you don't need to go there anymore right my logic stop it that's it but Jesus was saying something totally different and exhorted him, do not be afraid, just believe. So it's very important that uh, on crucial situations we go through, 
if you are still believing for miracles or I don't know what kind of situation, you can apply this for many different situations or circumstances in your life. But it's important. It's important that we learn, that we develop the sensibility. And it, this is done mainly in the secret place, in intimacy with Jesus as we commune with him. It's important that we learn how to defer the voice of Jesus. What is it? What is it that Jesus is saying about the circumstances? Not what anyone else is saying, but what is Jesus saying? Because many times what Jesus is saying is totally opposite than what others are saying in the name of Jesus. So we need to discern. Sometimes, you know, even out of a good intention, you may give you say things that it's not really what God is saying. Even though there, there is wisdom and there is, you know, the Bible also says uh, that it's very good to have the counseling of many people. Um, and I believe in that. But we need to be aware and discern His voice, you know, and prioritize His voice over anything else, no matter what it is. So let's continue just to see the breakthrough, right? We all know this story, but let's just finish. So Jesus says, do not be afraid, only believe. So this is the message for you, for me, for us today. Do not be afraid. Believe, only believe. And stick with Jesus. In, in verse 37, and he permitted, look at this, another tip. He permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James. This is another, you see how important it is, the atmosphere of faith. Out of everybody, Jesus permitted only three, only those that were believing with him to follow to come together, to pray together with him, to be there in the room, in the in the clo close with him, you know? So this is very important because if you're believing for a healing, let's say that you're praying for a healing for somebody, and right there you have like 20 people laying hands and half of those people don't really believe the person can be healed, it's not good <laughs> because again, faith is the curance of heaven. So we need to make sure that whoever is around is really, you know, believing in that the same way you are and even for our own lives i would say don't share your life i mean we are to love everybody and be uh you know like uh, authentic with everybody but you don't need to share uh your dreams with everybody especially if they don't believe you know because when god does something he can do crazy stuff he usually chooses those that are less choosable <laughs> Those that nobody believes. And if you share with the whole people, you know, that they're not going to believe in your miracles, so it might not be, you know, wise to do that. So just stick to those that are walking in faith, to those that also speak the faith currents, the faith language, and they're together, you know, believing in healing, believing in signs and wonders, believing in the miracle. They're believing in what Jesus is doing and saying. They're not walking unbelief, they're not walking in criticism, in complaining, murmuring, whatever else it might be. So this is very important. Anyway, verse 38, Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw the tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. 39, When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead but sleeping. They ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, look how radical Jesus was. I love it. He had put them all outside. <laughs> he took only the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was. You see how much wisdom? Uh, and, and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talita Kumi which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Verse 42, immediately, immediately, the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. Wow. So to me here, the story is about a little girl. But this little girl that is dead could be a dream that you have, could be a word, could be a promise, could be a disease that you're facing, could be a job situation, a financial situation, a situation with your family. This little girl here could be anything that you're facing that is dead. And you need to have faith enough to walk in the room with Jesus 
Let him take that by the hand. Observe the word, the command that comes from the Father's mouth, that comes from the healer's mouth, that comes from the Savior's, the deliverer's mouth, which is Jesus saying, Arise. 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 And this could be even a word for us, for the church, for us to arise. As this little girl, that Jesus is saying, Arise. Take him by the hand, which is guidance and saying, arise. And then, as we do that, we see the miracle as she did. Immediately, she arose and walked. She immediately came out of that bad circumstance she was in. She came out and she already walked. And then it says here that she was 12 years old. Isn't it interesting? We have two situations here of 12. The lady 12 years in blood issues and this girl 12 years old. So the girl in 12 years old was dead. She died at 12. And a miracle for a woman after 12 years took place. So the first character in the story experienced life right away after 12 years of persistence. While the other one had 12 years alive and then dies at 12 years old and then resurrects. So this is not a coincidence because the number 12 means the number of government is the apostolic number, the number of government. So I believe that between many things, among many things that this word can tell us, one of the things that I want to leave, one of the words that I want to say today is that we as a church, it's time for us to arise. It's time for us to arise and to walk because 12 is already an age of government, of taking authority and beginning to step on like the word says, serpents and scorpions and anything because of Jesus and the authority of the name of Jesus, because that's what he says about us, the authority that he has given us. So it's time to come out of this stage of dormant and to begin to take position, to arise. Amen. So I just want to leave this word of encouragement to you. Maybe you're, you're facing any hard situation or, you know, or maybe you just lost hope, just like the ruler almost did. But he persisted. He didn't fear. And he believed. So just receive this word today. Fear not. Whatever you're facing, just fear not. And believe that he's with you. And get ready. Let the Savior, the Lord, the lover of your soul, take you by the hand. Listen to his word where he's telling you to arise and obey at the command of his voice and walk. Amen. God bless you all.